Now I want to look at a specific example of a retrosynthesis and a synthesis for the pharmaceutical compound Demerol. This is actually a brand name of the compound, not the official chemical name. Strangely, it ends in all, even though it doesn't contain an alcohol, but there you go, Demerol. Now, I should start out with a, a bit of a caveat here that I'm going to be using some specific reactions that you may not have seen before. I really don't want you to worry so much about the specific reactions that are engaged in this retrosynthesis and synthesis of Demerol. Instead, I want you to think generally about how we apply the conceptual tools, concepts, terms, etc., that we've seen in the past couple of videos to the retrosynthesis and the synthesis, and how we use aspects of the reactions, things like site selectivity, stereoselectivity, whether the conditions are acidic or basic and how that affects functional group compatibility to think about how well the synthesis will work. So let's start with the target. This is Demerol. One of the first things we should really do is kind of take stock of the functional groups that we find within the molecule. We see an ester here. There's an ethyl ester in the molecule. There's an amine, a cyclic amine, part of a six-membered ring. And there's a benzene ring or a phenyl ring. In this structure. And really a, a key point in Demerol is the place where all of these functional groups kind of come together, this central quaternary carbon right here. Quaternary carbon is, is actually a point of structural complexity in organic molecules because it can be difficult to establish a quaternary carbon, especially when that's stereogenic. It's not in the case of Demerol, which makes our lives much easier. But this should really be a focal point for our attention in thinking about how to simplify Demerol to simpler starting materials because converting that quaternary carbon into a less substituted carbon is absolutely a simplifying transform. So how would we go about doing this? Well, one thing I notice right off the bat is that this quaternary carbon is an alpha carbon. It's alpha to the ester right here. One thing that helps me see is that these carbon-carbon bonds can potentially be created by engaging that alpha carbon as a nucleophile. In the forward direction, if I imagine starting with an unsubstituted, or really just a monosubstituted, say the phenyl ring is there, ester, I can establish both of these carbon-carbon bonds that I'm highlighting in red through alkylation reactions by treating an enolate, for example, with an alkyl halide. And actually, before even worrying about those specifics, what I can think about is just simply breaking these carbon-carbon bonds toward the alpha carbon. And we can kind of do one at a time to think about how this might work. This approach, actually moving electrons, using curved arrows to move electrons around in the target, is what I like to call mechanistic retrosynthesis. And it's a great approach um, because we're not worrying so much about the specifics. You know, I've, I've really already said too much by saying you know, things like enolate and, and alkylation really looking at the target and realizing that this alpha carbon, alpha to the ester, can support negative charge, gives me a hint that I should break this bond in the direction of that alpha carbon to give electrons to that center in the compound that comes before. And so we can imagine a hypothetical structure, which is not, of course, going to be a stable compound that we can put in a bottle, but something that we can at least use to kind of get the juices flowing, to start thinking in the abstract, we can imagine a hypothetical structure that looks like this. Now, I don't want to worry about the cation for a second. I want to focus on the alpha carbon and the ester. And now what I've realized upon drawing this is that this structure I'm highlighting in blue is essentially the enolate of an ester. It's a stabilized carbanion. There are resonance structures we can draw that show that that negative charge is delocalized. That suggests, because this is a relatively stable structure, at least at the negative charge, that this is a reasonable disconnection to make. Now, the cation looks a little bit ridiculous, right, because it's a primary carbocation. However, we're just thinking in hypotheticals right now, right? If we could attach potentially a leaving group or nucleophage to that carbon, we could make it act like a carbon with positive charge. We just attach something to it that wants to take electrons with it, like a bromine atom or a tosylate or a chlorine atom, something like this. We're going to talk more in detail about this kind of hypothetical approach to retrosynthesis in the next video, but I'll briefly just mention that these structures where we break bonds and kind of imagine where the charges end up and think about charge stability are called synthons. They're not real structures. They're often not even real reactive intermediates. They're just hypothetical structures that we use to guide our thinking 
when doing retrosynthesis. In fact, I can kind of think about doing this particular disconnection twice, not at the same time, but imagining this reaction could happen sequentially, right, to get back to a structure in which both of those carbon-carbon bonds have broken. Because, of course, if the approach works for one of the carbon-carbon bonds, it's going to work equally well for the other. This allows us then to work backwards to a very simple ester structure in which both of the carbon-carbon bonds involving the amine functional group at a distance have been broken and we've got now just a secondary carbon with two hydrogens at that alpha position. The other reactant in this case would involve that amine containing fragment and remember when we were thinking in the synthon approach we would have positive charges at these carbons which looks a little ridiculous but to actually achieve that in practice all we have to do is link up good leaving groups to those carbons so say a couple of bromines and now we've got a structure that is a real structure that serves the function of that synthon with positive charges and that's pretty much it we're not going to worry about what other reagents to use. This, this reaction in the forward direction does require additional reagents, but we can worry about those specifics when we draw the synthetic scheme in the forward direction. Now we apply the process iteratively, starting from, let's say, the ester and working backwards to even simpler starting materials. How could we work this ester back to even simpler starting materials? Well, there are several different directions you could go, and that, again, highlights the kind of branching nature or network nature of organic synthesis, but one place that catches my attention is in the ester functional group. In particular, this carbon-oxygen bond within the alkoxy group can be simplified back to an OH group. In the forward direction, converting that OH to an O-ethyl group would involve esterification. So this is an esterification transform. In the reverse direction, it just looks like replacing the ethyl group with a hydrogen to establish a carboxylic acid. The other, where would we get the ethyl group from is, is worth thinking about. Really, when you're doing retrosynthesis, you want to think about incorporating all of the carbons into the structures you draw. And so the, the ethyl carbons then are going to come from ethanol in this case. And really the retron is, is what I've highlighted in blue. So the, the ester alkoxy group, at least this carbon, perhaps the entire alkoxy group, and the carbonyl, is the retron for the esterification transformation. Makes sense, right? An ester is the retron of esterification. And just to back up one more step, this was an alkylation transform that we looked at in the first stage. And the retron is, again, what I've highlighted in blue. It's the ester group with the two alkyl carbons connected to the alpha carbon of the ester. Ethanol is pretty much as simple as you can get, you can absolutely buy this from Sigma Aldrich, but we can work this carboxylic acid back to an even simpler structure by noticing that the carboxyl group is connected to a benzylic carbon, a carbon linked to a phenyl group. And so that carbon being linked to the phenyl stabilizes positive and negative charges. And that opens the door to a variety of possibilities actually for how we might construct this molecule. The one that we'll be most familiar with in Chem 2312 and 2313 involves thinking about negative charge at that position. And so, you know, the synthon then would look something like this, and that could be combined with carbon dioxide to establish this benzylic carboxylic acid in the forward direction. In practice, again, rather than using the synthon, we need to choose a specific reagent. And here that just involves replacing with a metal. So something like a benzylic Grignard reagent with NGCl linked here would work great for this. And here again, although you can certainly buy this benzylic Grignard reagent, this could even be worked all the way back to benzyl chloride, which that plus magnesium is going to give you the Grignard reagent. And again, this you can buy from Sigma Aldrich. So we've worked our way back to starting materials that can be bought very easily, can be found in common feedstocks, petroleum-based or renewable feedstocks, and we've simplified substantially. We've gone down to much smaller numbers of carbons in the starting materials, really one functional group or a maximum of two functional groups in each structure and that kind of thing. In the next video, our task will be to reconstruct the synthesis 
in the forward direction and make sure it works. Looking at things like functional group compatibility, are there issues with, for example, the amine functional group reacting when we don't want it to or need it to? And this is an important check because not all retrosynthetic pathways lead to reasonable syntheses in the forward direction, primarily because of functional group compatibility issues, but also because of things like stereoselectivity in reactions where we need a specific stereochemical outcome in the target.